um, was read, this Exodus 34, 5 to 8, I wanted to, um, wanted this to be read as it, because it's a backdrop. It's not just, it's not a backdrop that I want to use. It's a backdrop that God has revealed in which man is called to be able to make some proper reasonings um, on the person of God himself and on, on our situation, on salvation. What is salvation if it isn't the, um, the rescuing of those who desperately needed mercy? What is wrath if it isn't on those who do not respond to the salvation that God's prepared for them? See, this is um, right thinking doesn't accidentally happen. God's prepared an environment wherein if you'll just listen to him, if you'll give God your ear, you'll be able to um, reason properly. God set the stage for salvation, so to speak. I want to use these, um, use these verses rightly. See, this is, there's a right way to think about God. And there's a wrong way to think about God. And I don't know that it's possible to rightly understand mercy outside of the environment of wrath. See, there, God's mingled these two things together because God in wrath can remember mercy. And but see, that this, the fact of the matter is that man is in the desperate need of the mercy of God. Amen. And of course, God's put him there on purpose. This, 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 this didn't, didn't start in the garden. It started before the foundation of the world. This is something that God's been doing. All of the attributes of God, all of them. Now, now, incidentally, we don't know all the attributes of God. We know the ones he's revealed to us, right? We don't know everything there is to know about God. Uh, it, so uh, well, we, can, we can reason on the ones that he's revealed because those, they belong to us. And unto our children. See, the things that God's revealed that he's opened up, well, we, uh, we can reason on them. We can, we can get some benefit from them. All of the attributes of the Lord, they operate together. And we cannot have mercy. Well, look at it like this. You can't have mercy outside of the confines of justice. It has to be right for God to be merciful to you. God just can't just, because just, he wants to. There's a sense in which he wants to. But look at how God's worked it out to where he's absolutely right in saving you. This just was no accident. Before time existed, God worked this out, and he implemented it, and it's absolutely perfect. It's right, it's just, it's holy. It's all with, contained within his own person. See, he's, he's just in doing this. Now, there is, I mean, this is a very large subject, and obviously this can't be expressed. We don't have the time to do it all at one time here. But, um, I wanted to just think about this for a few minutes, just lay us some kind of a, a basis for thinking about the mercy of God in the, in, um, in the context of, of Exodus 34 and also in some of the verses in Romans. There is no doubt but, but where we're standing today looking back on what God's accomplished in the person of Christ Jesus and all the revelation that he gave the prophets and all the revelation that, that he's given in the entirety of of, of, of the book that he's given us, the testimony, there's no doubt that God is merciful. See, we're looking at it from a very unique perspective. We're looking back on, see, but some of these, some of these patriarchs, they had no idea. They had never been told that God was merciful. He's a merciful God. And yet some of the things they would say, he's a merciful God. Where did he get that idea from? You can't become, you can't come in contact with a person of God and not know this. This is something that you know about God because um, this is the way God is. This is who he is. The Psalms 19.9, this is the way David saw it. It says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. When you see God, you come to the right idea about God. Why aren't people coming to the right idea? Because they're not seeing the right God. They're not, they're not being introduced to the right God. And so, of course, they got all kinds of strange ideas nowadays. People come to the wrong conclusions. People get the idea that I can do whatever I want and God will just still love me the same. Why do I say that? Because this is the conclusions that people are making today. Did anybody in the scripture ever get that idea? I don't think they did. I don't think they could come to the conclusion that I can be in God's presence and just do whatever I want. 
There's no other God. There's no other God like the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see how specific that is? It's very specific. We have a, a God that is, he's represented himself in a very specific way in the person of Christ Jesus. Remember Jesus said he would show us, he showed us the Father, see? He's a represent, representative. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now that's very specific. There's no other God like that. He, and we might say he alone, is the merciful God. He's the one. To, we wouldn't have any idea what mercy was at all had he not revealed it. We know by revelation that he's abundant in goodness and truth. Abundant. It's not like, like maybe if you go to him and you beg long enough, he'll be merciful. See, this is, he's willing. He's, he's on the initiative. Why? Because this is who he is. This is his nature. God didn't just start being merciful after he created man. Uh -huh. God, from the very beginning, way back, he's a merciful. He's a, he, well, of course, he's t told Moses. He told Moses exactly. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. All right, now, at the same time now, See, this is, one, this is one aspect of his nature. But at the same time, and without reservation, and that will by no means clear the guilty. This is our God. If you're going to get something from him, you've got to get out of the category of guilty and into the category of redeemed. It's got to happen. But see, this is our God. You can go to him. You can, you can confess your sins. And because of the work of Christ, he faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Why? Because he's a merciful God. He's ready to pardon. He's ready. His mercy and his wrath are part and par parcel of who he is. You can't have one without the other. And actually, if you see it right, you wouldn't want it that way. Amen. You want God just as he is. David said, thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. The, uh, man could go his whole life long and search out God. But if God didn't want to be known, he wouldn't find out anything about God. God is in control of his revelation of who sees, who doesn't see, who knows, who doesn't know. Nehemiah said, thou art a God ready to pardon. Why did Nehemiah see that? Because he saw God. See, he, he, he saw an aspect of God that maybe others around him didn't even know. Nehemiah saw it. Ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. Nehemiah knew of the hard hardness of the people. At the same time, see, Nehemiah saw God for who he was and saw the people for who they were. And when uh, Nehemiah summarizes centuries of disobedience and encapsulizes the root of the condition of the people, this is how he said it. They withdrew their shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. That's what, that's what Nehemiah's assessment of the people were. They wouldn't hear. They wouldn't submit to this merciful God. This one that was ready to forgive them. He was ready to bring them back. The, they wouldn't hear him. Well, so that's hopeless, right? Well, this is what he says. He doesn't stop there. That's what he says. says, yet many years thou didst forbear them. All right? And testified against them by his spirit and the prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the land of the people of his lands. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we have a God that you can say, nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, Thou did not utterly consume them. You look back at Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Nobody else did, but Noah did. See, never we have a God that's He's a great, He's great in mercy. All right? Now you think about it at the time. See, ask, all right, ask one of Moses' kids, well, how what does the grace of God mean to you? It means I didn't I didn't die with the rest of the whole world because of my father. My father found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and I was with him, and I didn't die when everybody else died. 
How can Nehemiah talk like this? How can he say things like, Thou art a gracious and a merciful God? He, he put them in bondage, didn't he? That's how merciful God is. Sometimes God can hand you over to your enemies. That's a, that's a part of his mercy. If for his mercy, you weren't utterly consumed, but see, God's intent on you understanding who he is. From the very beginning, this is what he's doing. He wants to manifest his own nature, make himself known. Actually, salvation has more to do with God than it does to do with people. People are used. People are the means through which God does this. Even in Job's time, remember Job? He was cast into the furnace of affliction. Uh, I, nothing that he did, by the way, that caused it. Remember, God says, you moved me without a cause against him. But he spake these words about the God of heaven. This is what he says. Who doeth great things past finding out. Yeah. That's Job 9.10. Past finding out. Yea, wonders without number. But you'll never find them out. You can look for them. You'll never see them. Not unless God reveals them. Not unless God opens them up. Yeah. But God's, I'm saying this. Why? Because if you have tasted that the Lord is merciful. You have, to some degree... The fact that you're in Christ right now, you've tasted of the mercies of the Lord. Why? Because God wanted you to see it. Otherwise, you'd have never seen it. This isn't something you just worked up and you got strong enough now that where I know I can understand some of the mercies of the Lord. No, you've tasted of the Lord that he's merciful. The Apostle Paul in Romans, he's speaking about this past finding out, which means you couldn't just figure it out on your own. He says, all oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forevermore. Now, there's a lot of him in that verse, isn't there? Yes, There's a lot of him in salvation. This is what it is. It's about him. God's doing something before the world ever was. Before he, technically, from the foundation of the world means before he ever conceived of even creating a world, he determined something. And then that determination, the determination to do this resulted in the effects of, I'm going to build a world. I'm going to work out what I've determined. So I'm going to build a world. I'm going to make man in my image. But all this stemmed from God's desire to be known. Amen. He had to have some creatures that needed mercy, right? If he's going to be merciful, he, God's merciful. But how are you going to demonstrate that? How are you going to show that to people? How are you going to open that up? Well, you're going to have to have a needy people. And these needy people have to be made in your image. If you're going to be working in them, showing of yourself to them in order that angels and principalities and powers and heavenly places can understand something of a God that's not exactly in their nature. See, under what, which of the angels said he at any time sit at my right hand? So he had to have a man that was created in his image after his likeness so that God could work things about him in them. See, this, this, is, this is our God. He's, he's gracious and he's merciful. And he's um, done all things well. Now, unless God had determined before the foundation of the world to divulge that he was merciful, no personality in heaven would have ever known it. The angels, when they fell, the ones, the, the elect angels, they didn't look back and say, Ooh, God's merciful. Did you notice how he cast Lucifer? Down to the earth? How merciful he was. They didn't get that idea. No, no. See, they knew he, was, he had power. They knew he was God and that he could do his will both in heaven and in the earth. They knew that. They knew it was just. But see, to the degree, even in that rudimentary knowledge, they knew he was God, but they didn't see what they were going to see in man. Oh, this was good. God was going to work in this project, salvation, to divulge his character, who he was, who he is. 
And in the age that comes, see, we're going to learn a little bit more about his kindness, aren't we? Yes. We've seen it to a great degree, but we haven't seen it all. Now, in my opinion, the day that Adam fell, see, Satan, as Lucifer, never saw this aspect of God. He didn't know God was merciful. And so it's in my opinion that when, when he tempted them and got them to eat of the tree, that he was expecting something very different than what happened. When God came in the cool of the day and, react, and said, Adam, where are you? He, because all he had seen of God was his judgment. Oh, now God shows up on the scene and he doesn't just condemn them, does he? He does condemn the serpent, though. He, he, he does pronounce a curse on him. God's never, God has never not known what's going on. I say that because he in the garden, if you're not careful, you can say, well, things got out of hand. I've actually heard people say it. Oh, no, you know. What's going on here? God didn't say, oh, no, what's going on here? God knew exactly what was going on here. Project Salvation's right on track. It's right on track. He, it wasn't any mistakes. Okay, Adam, Adam, he sinned, and he fell by transgression. He disobeyed God. But see, God, in his infinite mercy, see, he gets his... Now, now see, well, we're, we're starting to see a little bit of what it means for God to work His purpose, all things according to the counsel of His own will. So am I attributing the fall to God? No, I'm attributing it to Adam. He sinned. He fell by disobedience. This is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. But see, known unto God are all His works before the foundation of the world. God knows what He's doing. I say this because we, in confidence, see, we, confidence will say, you, you got to trust God because God knows the end from the beginning. I don't. He does. And so we just move forward from there. God's never not known what's going on. Nothing's ever been out of control from God's side of the equation. God's never relinquished power or control to anybody. Okay? He put His Son, He's given Him all power in heaven and earth. He... he Hebrews 1.10 says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Amen. He's, he's, he's above all these other things. God's been ruling and commanding from the, from the center of the earth, as it were. The, 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 from the very beginning, God is working his own will. So when it says, In the beginning, God, that's exactly what it means. God, before anything, it was God, see? The whole drama called salvation has all been about and is about God working in the midst of the earth. The term, I've already said this, from the foundation of the world, now actually it occurs more than ten times in the Bible, but the concept is even more than that. It's before the beginning of time, before anything else existed, God, he was there he determined, he purposed. The term defines a point wherein God purposed something before he brought it to pass so he could bring it to pass. See, God doesn't experiment. God's not playing any, any games or experimenting. God's working his will in the midst of the earth. Specifically, the word foundation means concept or to conceive. So before, before the world was even conceived, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that is tied to that in the scriptures. A lot, of, a lot of different ideas that were tied to that because the God's big and His purpose is big. His eternal purpose is just that. It's eternal, which means it's got to outlast this world. You know, if this is going to have an end. God's going to fold it up. The earth is going to pass away with a great noise, but His eternal purpose isn't going to pass away. It's going to meet a, a time of fulfillment in which time we'll more than likely see that it was all in order that, which means there's more up ahead. He's working salvation in order that in the ages to come. See, there's, it's more. There's more to it. There are some things that God purposed to do <clears throat> before he conceived. I want to be careful when I say this, but, but this is what the in the foundation of the world is implying. Before he conceived the manner in which he would perform it. Which means that God's, God's desire moved him to create a world. His purpose. There are some things that God 
in its purpose required other things to fulfill it. Why is the world here? It's not just here for beauty. It's here to work out the eternal purpose of God. God's got a purpose. And in order for that purpose to be fulfilled, he created the heavens and the earth. He created man in his image, set him here. And um, in the end, he's, when he's done with it, in other words, he's going to fold it up and we'll get on with the next phase of project, God's projects. There are just a few, well, here, here's just a few things that are tied with that. How about this? The works were finished, by God's works, before the foundation of the world. So God, in the, even in the creation, he wasn't like guessing. Yeah. You know, people say, well, you just for millions of years. God wasn't guessing. It didn't take millions of years to create the world. We have a record. Amen. He did it in seven days. That's what it says. Why? Because the works were finished before the foundation of the world. The secret things. How about those things? It says that all other things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? God's... Well, there's a lot of, actually, there's technically, there's a lot of secret things that we don't know anything about. The secret things belong to the Lord. But see, the things that have been revealed, he, he, he kept them for a certain amount of time until the time was right, and then he divulged them. There wasn't any way in the world that man could figure it out ahead of time. Couldn't happen, because God kept it secret. See, in order to do that, you've got to be outside of time. So you've you, you got to be God, and then you can keep something secret. I mean, people will tell you they've tried to keep things secret. You can't keep, you can't, not even one thing about yourself secret. If you, <clears throat> God can, though. He can have secret things. God the current, uh, has the ability to work all things according to the counsel of his own will, right? It doesn't make any difference if Nebuchadnezzar wants to or not. It doesn't make any difference, you know, if Pharaoh wants to or not. He can harden his heart, and then he can... I'm going to pursue after the Israelites. What happened? God's working his will. See, this is God. He, he can work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, or, or there's other things that are worked in men. Now, it's, to, but to the point, my point is that this is God's determination. This is God's world. This is God's eternal purpose. This is, this is God working. And when you, when you come to mercy, it's not all of a sudden you step back and say, well, it's just whatever we want it to be. No, no. Mercy is defined by God, comes from God, and works things to God. This, this is what it is. It's not, it's not, mercy is not an arbitrary thing that you can make it wherever you want it to be. This is God, and it's God's mercy. He has determined, I'm talking now about, about what God's determined to do. I'm talking about um, the things that, that God, it, it, um, he's conceived, or before the, before the foundation of the world, he's determined to do, <clears throat> before the foundation of the world, he has determined to save them that believe. Now, I know there's some, there's some that, 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 that they don't believe this, but they need to. Because um, Matthew 25, 34 says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now that's what it says. So I just want to believe that that's what he did. Before the foundation of the world, he determined to save them to believe. There was a kingdom that was prepared for some. All right, He's had, he also has determined to destroy the wicked. Revelation 17, 8 says, They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. That's Revelation 17, 8. So you got Matthew 25, 34 and Revelation 7, 17, 8, and they're both saying the same thing, that God's working his own will. He's working all things according to the counsel of his own will. That's what it means. They will, is, that, is that limiting? No, God's not limited. God's doing exactly what God wants to do. Jesus, when he came, he taught the same thing. He said it in a parable form. Remember, they came to him and they said, why do you talk to men in parables? He said the same thing as this. 
He said it in a different way. He said, so they won't understand, so it'll be brought to pass what was spoken in Isaiah. Uh, how about this? The Lamb of God. He was, he was before the world ever was. He was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. John 17, 24 says, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which was given me because thou lovest me. When? Before the foundation of the world. So God, did, I, I know I don't have to stress this too far. God does what he wants to do. I, I, this is what God does. God does what he wants to do. Now there's a sense in which God gives us liberty. Now we're all going to have to stand before him to give an account of deeds done in the body, right? We're all going to someday going to have to stand before God and we're going to have to give an answer. Why, what did you do with the amount of space and time that I gave you? That's a very real reality. We're going to have to do that. But you can see in that the imagery of God that God put in you. What will you do with your time? What will you do? Because everyone's going to have to give an account because God's given you a space where you can, it may even seem like you can do exactly what you want to do. Well, there's a sense in which you can, but see, the, the fact that you got to give an account for it to the God of glory shows um, <clears throat> that we're not as free as some people think we are. I mean, he's got to give an account to someone, then you've got to be a servant, right? So, salvation technically is about God revealing unique and dis distinct aspects of his divine nature through his dealings or workings in men. But God works in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure. But you're not an island set off here all by yourself, see? Principalities and powers are looking on, and they see, oh, this, one, this one was lost. This one used to be in the pit. Now look, he's not. God set him up on a mountain. God's put his spirit inside of him. What happened? God's working all things according to the counsel of his own will. See, God's, God's showing. God's, it's bigger than you. Salvation is bigger than you. It's about you. You're the one God saved. And in the end, you're the one that's going to be delivered and in his presence forevermore. But see, it's, it's much, much more. Actually, then you'll see all the times that God used you Maybe, maybe he said, consider my servant, Brother Mike. Have you considered him? You, you see what I'm saying? God's working up here on a much higher level than what we can fully understand here. But it is God that's doing the work. Consider, consider how much planning had to go into the unveiling of God's glory. I mean, from our standpoint, this was an impossibility. We're not God, and we can't think we can't think like God. Now, there's a sense in which we've been given the mind of Christ, but it's not to think these kind of things. I'm not sitting back and thinking, I'm going to create a couple of worlds, and then I'll, you see what I'm saying? This is, <clears throat> God's thinking the kind of thoughts that only God can think. God's purpose is fitting for a God. So, say me, when he purposes stuff, it's far beyond our comprehension. Who can know it? Who can stay his hand if he considers it, if he wants to do it? Well, he's going to do it because he's God. And now he's brought you into the picture in salvation. He's brought you in and you become a vessel. Of, of, see, a vessel of mercy. You're a vessel. This is a vessel of mercy. See, from God's perspective, which is what I'm trying to, to, to see in, inside of this backdrop of Exodus 34, that God's in charge. God's doing what he's doing. He's going to reveal his mercy and he's going to reveal his wrath. He's going to all to get together here. And from heaven's vantage point, he's never lost control of anything. He's got some vessels of mercy and he's got some vessels of wrath. And he's showing, look at what I can do. Look, at what I, look who I am. Look what I've done here. Look at this vessel. This vessel used to persecute the church. Look what he's doing now. Why? Because of my mercy. That's why. I'm a merciful God. Paul puts it in the form of a question in Romans 9. This really blessed me. Um, years ago, I saw this and I, I was like, as it were, on cloud nine. <laughs> because this shows, this encapsulates the eternal purpose of God in, in one chapter and and exposes 
God's eternal purpose, that God's in charge. And, you know, the, the, the scoffers, this is not for them. This is not for people who don't want to accept that God's in control. Yeah. Romans 9 will escape somebody that just doesn't want to believe that God can do whatever God wants to do. Amen. Amen. Romans 9 is too high for that. See, Romans 9 gets a hold of God's eternal purpose and brings it down, as it were, to the everyday man's level and says, See, God can do what he wants to do. Amen. He's going to do it. Amen. And he says it in such a, such a wonderful way. Paul says, What if God? Now, see, I don't think a lot of people have ever thought, thought about the fact that God's the one that's got his hand on everything. Every single, there's nothing that escapes God. God's doing it. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known, you got that and there, I said a lot. Yeah. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared on the glory. Now that's just everything I just said before. Yeah. Yeah. All right? Even, even us, he's talking about people now, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now the fact that God is a merciful God was made known in part to the prophets. They saw a glimpse of it. They even participated in it. They, they, they could say, I've tasted that the God is merciful, but not like now. Not like now. There's something new happening now. The specifics of the workings out of that mercy was not made known until sin was put away and God's Christ was exalted at his own right hand and it opened up the floodgates for God to be merciful unto his people. Amen. See, in the past, it was one or two. You read about it and it's very sparse. Every once in a while, God would be merciful to someone. Now, all the people, we all know him from the least to the greatest. We know Him. We trust in Him. We're walking in His Spirit. What are you talking about? I got the Spirit of God in me. I know God's merciful. Remember, um, in photography, when a picture is developed, images that were already on the paper are seen through a process. You put some chemicals on them, and all of a sudden, this picture comes up. It was there all along, right? As soon as the as soon as the image hit the paper, it was there. You just couldn't see it. See, God has had this purpose from the very beginning. And it hasn't changed, not even one little tiniest bit. It's God's eternal purpose. And he's working it out. Now, the problem wasn't with God's eternal purpose. It was with man's perception of God's eternal purpose. So what God's doing in salvation, he's bringing us to be able to comprehend the uncomprehensible. Flesh cannot perceive the things of God. See, they're spiritual. So you got to get out of the flesh and into the spirit of God. Next thing you know, you start agreeing with God. You start saying, yeah, I'm making my calling and election sure. I can see it now. I can see that I've got to put my hand to the plow. If this is going to get done, I'm gonna, i got to make it sure to me. Because until it's made sure to me, it's awfully hard to do it. God didn't just start being merciful after he created man. He didn't. He's merciful the whole time. Just like the picture was there on the paper the whole time. God's been a merciful God. But see, until he works in you, until you see it for, that, for what it really is, you won't appreciate God's mercy. Until you see that there's a day coming when he's going to say to some people, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Till you see that, mercy doesn't mean a whole lot. But when you see that he extended himself and he delivered you from the grip of the, of the, of the enemy and he set your feet on a rock and he established your way, you can say, my God is merciful. He's mighty to deliver. See, now it becomes real. Now it becomes yours. Now you can tell people God's merciful. He's a merciful God. The fall of man had caused such a rift between, God, between man and God, technically, that a bridge, so to speak, had to be constructed by God on which 
bits of understanding could concerning himself could cross over to the hearts of men. The, the prophets is like this, giving them little bits, little pieces. This is what my eternal purpose is. If you can see it, just, just you remember they hoped for it. They longed for it. They looked forward to the time when sin would be put away. We're living in the full-blown open heaven. Sin's been put away. We have access to God through faith. We can come boldly, confidently, because he's been merciful to us. Amen. See, this is there's no excuse for the church to be dying today. No excuse. Amen. Before Christ died, rose, and ascended to heaven, man was limited as to how much they could know. How much can you know about God's mercy before your sin's taken away? But afterward, oh, see, it opens. Your capacity is increased. I can know him whom I have believed in. And I can be confident that he's going to do everything he promised. Everything he promised he's going to do. Why? Because he's merciful. In this first message, I'm trying to emphasize the, 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 about this grand question. Now consider this. What if... God, which means that, see, God's purpose is so grand, it has to be put down, it has to be, to some degree, shrunk down, as it were, to where our minds can comprehend it, can get a handle on it. Amen. What if God? This is a good example. Paul's going to give us an adequate example to be able to, to, to have a rudimentary understanding of the eternal purpose of God just in these few words. What if God? He, God's, God's willing to show something. God wants to show something. He wants to deliver something that men can comprehend. What if God? The apostle is directing our minds into a proper way to think about and to consider the wrath and the mercy of God at the same time. You see how one complements the other. You take the wrath of God, you got these vessels of wrath. All right? And then you got these vessels of mercy. He's like, oh, that, the, this is different. They're not the same, are they? The vessels of wrath are not the same as the vessels of mercy. You say, well, wait a minute. They come from the same lump. Yeah, they did. Now, doesn't they, took, they came from the same lump. Now, only God could do this. Amen. Only God could do this. Yeah, I kind of get excited. I know I came from the same lump. I know there was nothing in me. Nothing in me that God looked at and said, oh, there's something special. No, no, no. What The special part is what he did with the lump. Amen. There's no question that God's merciful and he's gracious and he's long-suffering and he's abundant in goodness and truth. This is who he is. It's the outworking of it. It's as he does it in you that now it becomes you become energized and you see this is God. It said, how, what other testimony could you have? See, when God works in you, he's a consistent. He works consistent with his nature. So you say, God's worked in me, and, and I just want to steal so much. You see how that doesn't make any sense? God worked in me, and the things that I used to do, I don't do them anymore. What happened? God's in this house. Amen. You see, what? God's consistent. He's keeping mercy for thousands. But that isn't all he is. It's not just that God's merciful. It's not just that the, the, the God's just. He will by no means clear the guilty. God's anger with the wicked every day. That's in Psalm 711. It's the truth. God's soul can be grieved. Judges 10, 16. It can be grieved. A man can do something that will grieve God. Woe to that man. God's soul can hate Psalms 11.5 and Isaiah 1.14. It can hate. His soul can hate things. For a person to remain in the camp of the guilty and assume or expect God to receive them just as they are, it reveals a basic ignorance of who God is. God won't. It isn't a matter. See, well, can he do it? He won't do it. It's against who he is. Especially in our day when he's provided a way to escape I can escape. I can clean escape them that live in there. Amen. So now in that time, how can you justify this before God? That I stayed in the enemy's camp because I know you're loving. Really? You, know, you do know what's going to happen. He's going to say, beat that man with many stripes. What's going to happen? You're living in the full-blown light of the gospel, and you don't 
You don't leave the camp of the enemy? Foolish man. Well, the Apostle Paul, he's very, very skillful. He's going to show this. He's going to bring this to the surface. He's going to show us that they're not everyone's the same. For a person to not see this, see, they have to be blinded, right? Doesn't know what he says? The rest, the rest, blinded. blinded. God developed, God's developed and, and, and not only, okay, I want to say this right. God, God hasn't developed it in himself. It's always been there. Okay? God isn't getting more merciful. God isn't getting more filled with wrath. God gets us who he is. Well, our understanding of it, the illumination of it, the, the ability to be able to see him for who he is, this is growing in, the, in, in people who can see him. In, in the ages, it wasn't, it wasn't just the individuals. It was the amount of revelation that God had exposed to where they could come up. In the new covenant, in the day we're living in, you can see God more precisely for who he is. And that's what Paul's pointing to. The apostle is very skillful in presenting a valid connection between God's mercy and his wrath and its impacts in salvation. Because he got doing this. Salvation isn't just about saving people. Now, I know that isn't popular to say, but Paul said it. The point of the apostle's discourse here is that both of these aspects of God's natures are being revealed at the same time in the same work called salvation. He's, he's working them both. He's exposing them both. Why? Because they both need to be seen. What if God, willing to show or reveal, see God's revealing something about himself in salvation, he's revealing his wrath, not just wrath in a general sense against the world. He showed that in the flood, didn't he? He showed that he, he has wrath against sin. That's a general. More specifically, his wrath toward a vessel of wrath. Now see, this is specific. It's just specific that God would have a vessel of wrath. Now, people can draw their own conclusions, but I like the one that Paul drew here. He contrasted it. He didn't, you know, he didn't dwell too much on this. He, 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 he kind of went through it. He kind of passed on through it because see, this, this could bog you down. There is a vessel of wrath. It's real. Just as real as the vessel of mercy. God's using it to reveal something, to show something. Vessels of wrath, we know by revelation, are fitted, just fitted for destruction, just like the vessels of mercies are fitted. Which means God's doing something in both of them. But now the question is what? And that's why he tells you to make your calling election sure, so make sure you're not one of these vessels of wrath. You don't want to be that. Amen. Believe me. Amen. What's he doing in both of them? He's making known his power. God's doing this. Making known his power. He endured what's much long suffering. He, God had to endure the, in order for him to show this aspect of his nature. This was very painful, speaking as a man, for God. He had to endure. Because they know God's justice would have just reached out and just, there wouldn't have been no more vessels of wrath. It had just been over with, all right. But so he endured it. Why? Because he's showing something of himself. He's showing that he's long suffering. Making his power known. But that's not all he's doing. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known and endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And, I like this part, and that he might, might make known. What specifically is God making known or showing or revealing? The riches of his glory. Now, how is God, you mighty God, He's, 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 he's so, so big. How's he going to get that? How are you going to understand that? How are you going to see that? He's making known the riches of his glory. The, 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 to be able to comprehend the fullness of God, you're going to need Christ. Amen. That's what you're going to need. Now see, the church aggregate, as you, see, as you get there, and you all get there on that on that day, and everyone together, every saint that ever lived, and they all stand there, and they're, they're going to bear together corporately the image of Christ. Well, so now you see how, how precise God is. The thing that he's working in you is not random at all, is it? The thing that he's working in you is a different aspect, a different, a different measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. He's working it in you. 
And on that day, just like the temple, perfectly, they fit together. The blocks, the, fit, the stones fit together, perfect. You're going to fit in your place in glory perfectly. This is what God's doing. But in order for him to do it, <clears throat> he had to endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. So see, this isn't a picture where God just determined, I'm going to send these to hell, and I'm going to send... See, this isn't, this isn't even the way God thinks. God's showing his glory. And in order to do that, there were some unpleasant things that God had to enter into. But he did it. He did it. He set his hand to the work, and he endured with much long suffering. Now see, this verse is there for a reason. It says not there to, um, to whitewash anything. It's there to divulge what God's doing. This is the way it is. There are vessels of wrath and there are vessels of mercy. Amen. They're both they're both there. They're both necessary for, for the, the riches of his glory to be seen. Mm -hmm. The contrast that the apostle is developing here, it assists us in being able to understand <clears throat> what God's doing in the person of Christ. Otherwise, how would you understand it? How would you know what God's doing to see? It's all too easy to theorize about it and to, and to philosophize about it and come up with God just working all kinds of pleasant things. That isn't all that's happening. There, it's a very real thing. He's going to say, depart from me. It, 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 we don't want to hear that. We want to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, now, then it doesn't behoove us on this side of the judgment to, to give attendance to these kind of words. These are very real. <clears throat> all of God's previous dealings with men in either his judgment of their sin or his blessings because of their faith serves as a sufficient backdrop on this, the stage of salvation. You see how God's given us a testimony of how he reacts to sin, how he reacts to faithfulness like in Abraham, how he reacts and the whole, when the whole world goes crazy. He destroyed the world. Their thoughts of their imagination was only evil continually. So what did God do? He took them out. Sodom and Gomorrah comes along. He took them out. That's how God feels about it. God doesn't have to do it every week for us to understand. This is how God feels about it. But what about a, God, a, a man who's faithful? What about a, a person who walks with God? We know how he feels about that too. Sometimes he'll just take them. Won't he? <laughs> so see, these, these testimonies that we have are on purpose given to us by God in order that we might serve him acceptably. We might make the right conclusions, come to the right conclusions. I mean, some of these are, are, are really simple, really. You can't have a holy God that's not offended by sin. Amen. You can't. I mean, it's just impossible. I mean, if you're going to compromise and say it's okay to sin, you've eliminated any contact with a holy God. How about this? You can't have the, a righteous God that's not angry with the wicked. So see, at what cost will you say to people, God loves you just the way you are? Do you see what it costs now? They have to be separated from a righteous God because a righteous God will judge them right then, see? So you can't have a compassionate God that acquits the guilty. Yeah. See, you can't. These things won't go together. What is God going to do? He's going to send Christ. God, he's going to make a way that he can be just and the justifier. You see how God's done this? He's done all things well. He really has. And, he's, and he works it out in the midst of trouble, in the midst of a world that, that seems, it looks like, you look out there just in, the, in your natural eyes, say it's just totally out of control. No, it's not. These kind of scriptures, see, they help to us to see that God's in control. He's working all things after the counsel of his own will. Amen. The scripture has examples where God was able to be filled with wrath and then at the same moment, remember mercy. That's a flood. He did it. He, he, it isn't like a theory. This is, we have an example in the scripture where in the middle of wrath, he's destroying the whole world. He remembered one man. He did it. See, I, I, I couldn't do that. I don't have that capacity. But God does, and I'm thankful He does. Amen. Yeah, there's a sense in which the world never got over the flood. It never did. 
this world we're living in right now never got over. It's not the same world as before the flood. Something happened. It says the world was destroyed. Yeah. So see, this, 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 this thing that people say, well, it's just gone on the same. No, it hasn't. The world all around us has indicators that something devastating happened to it. And yet, men just want to sweep it under the rug. But at the time that the flood was occurring, you wouldn't have found anybody that would say, well, I don't believe there's a God. Or maybe they would say, um, I don't believe that God can make his wrath known. The water's getting taller now. It's getting taller. See, we're living in a time that's just like this. Nobody wanted to think about God until it started raining. At the same time, the vessels of wrath... I'm speaking now in a type with the flood. At the same time they were being destroyed, the vessels of mercy were being saved. See, they, God chose to do it like this and give us so many different types so that we would understand that this is what God's doing. Guess what God's capable of? He's capable of destroying some and saving some at the same time. That's what God does. Why? So we would know that He's a merciful God that will not acquit the guilty. Amen. He will not. So now it would behoove those when the message goes out then, repent. All right? Repent. Save yourself from this untoward generation. Now if you know something about the testimony of the scriptures, you know something about the signs of the times, wouldn't it behoove us then to run to him for refuge? See, this is, this is why God's given us these testimonies. Now, God's determined to make himself known. We, we, we've seen that just a little bit. I haven't had much time. We're going to stop here. There's a very real contrast that the apostle's drawing for us, and we're going to build on it some more. But see, this contrast, this thing about God's mercy and God's wrath being able to be worked out at the same time is very profitable for our um, understanding. God determined to make himself known in the work of salvation, and the main work is not about men. It's about him. It's about who he is and what, what he's... Now, like I said, men are involved in it. We are. God's brought us into the work, as it were. That's why we're made in his image, after his likeness. See, we, we can have fellowship with God on a different level than the brute creation. I mean, that's kind of rudimentary Amen. statement, but it's true. See, we, we, God, this is why God called us into this fellowship of his dear son, because we can fellowship with him in his eternal purpose. That he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared on the glory. And when you get there on that day, you'll, even us, oh, even us. You know, when you can say it on this side, you know, the world loses some of its luster. When you can say, even me, I can see God's working in me. Amen. And I did the world that loses its charm. It, it, it's like, you're calling me out there. What do I have to do with you? I'm not coming down off the wall. I'm not. Because I know now that I'm, it's, I'm even one of them. I'm, I'm one of them, see. And, and this is the, obviously the brother Paul here. He's dealing with these Romans. Now, he's dealing with people who didn't have a background like the Hebrews had. And he's showing them. He's showing them that this is our God. This is what he's doing right now. And he's calling them into the work. Come in. Understand this, because if you do, you'll be able to make some ground with God. Well, thank you, brethren. Amen.